Welcome everybody to Archive Dives. Each week we pick a state-of-the-art research paper about machine learning. We like to pick papers that have traditionally been around for a while, uh, but this week we're switching it up and doing a, a recent paper called Mamba, which uh, leaves, leaves me with some questions at the end of the paper, but I'm excited to dive in and, and show you what I learned so far. So with that said, let me pull up the Notion page and feel free to follow along with this as we go or ask any questions as we go as well. So this paper is from teams at, or actually just two people, one from Carnegie Mellon and one from Princeton. It was released in December of 2023, so super recent and has gotten a lot of hype uh, it is it is a technique that is a lot faster than than traditional models that we've seen, and it also scales to extremely long content context sequence lengths. So they claim that they get five x faster throughput than your traditional transformer, and it scales linearly instead of quadratically with the length of the sequence. And because of this, this scaling, it, its performance shows promise on data up to lengths of a million, which is pretty exciting. A lot of these transformer models, as soon as you get to like a couple thousand tokens, start to get slow or start to have a hard time consolidating all the information. So this is pretty exciting for a lot of different use cases. There's all the generative text ones like chatbots, summarization, information retrieval. They also do some studies on audio generation, genomics, and time series data, which all require extremely, extremely long sequences. And they call it Mamba because one, they're building on the work of these uh, state space models they're called the previous work was called s4 because it's a structured state space sequence model uh i found this twitter thread of albert one of the authors and he said it's called mamba because it's deadly and its core mechanism is the evolution of s4 which is a lot of s's so it just kind of sounds like a snake which i thought was pretty clever so the motivation behind this paper is that all of the current state-of-the-art foundation models pretty much today use the transformer architecture with the self-attention mechanism. We've gone over this architecture in previous dives, but the problem with it is that it does not scale very well to long sequences. So if you remember, our example here from a few weeks ago, uh, if you have a sentence like you can fly from LA to New York while a fly buzzes around your head in the plane, that is a sentence with 21 different tokens. And the self-attention mechanism within a transformer goes through all of those tokens uh, quadratically. So each one looks at each other one to get context into what each word means. So for this simple example, there's 21 tokens. 21 times 21 is 441 combinations that the network has to go through between through the keys, queries, and values matrices. So what they want to do is get rid of that quadratic behavior um, and have a much faster inference time. So there's many architectures that already do this. Uh, you might be familiar with recurrent neural networks. They use what are called structured space models or structured, I think, state space models, um, which at the end of the day, SSMs are just a version of a recurrent neural network. They just have some tricks that they do in between uh, to make them work better. So if you're not familiar with what a recurrent network is, it's basically just taking an input sequence 
and trying to do the same thing we're doing with the transformer. So if we take the text example and we have the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog, uh, you would take the first word, run it through some hidden state and try to predict the next word. Then you feed in the next word to that hidden state try to predict the subsequent word and just recursively do that over and over again. But there are a few issues uh, when people have tried to train these recurrent neural networks in the past. One, they try to collapse all the information in that sentence into this one hidden layer. So they tend to forget things <laughs> when you have much longer sequences. Um, and while RNNs are fast for generation, because they just linearly go over the sequence instead of quadratically, they are typically much slower than a transformer for training um, for reasons that we can get into later. Um, but I would, I would love to give this example of why it is hard to collapse all of the information into a hidden space for an RNN. So I made this visual example of that same sentence above and say you only had four variables within your hidden space to encode all of the information. And I just color coded each one of these words. You can imagine for the first word, really easy. Let's just store information about that word. For the second word, sure, let's just pop it in. For the third word, yes. But once you get farther and farther down the chain, you have to start picking and choosing and being selective about what you store in this hidden spa space, in this vector there. And you're gonna have to drop things from earlier in the sentence or drop things that are less important for you to predict the next word. I think concretely, if you thought about it as, <laughs> characters instead of words, say we were trying to encode this sentence right here, say we had a latent space, hidden space of five to remember the context. If we only used characters to represent that hidden space, sure, we could start with saving every single character and predicting the next one. But then as we go along, we're going to have to selectively drop characters until you can predict the next one. And if you have a very small hidden space, you might just want to store the last couple things to predict the next thing. So this is like one of the main problems with recurrent neural networks is how you encode everything into the hidden space. Um, there are techniques like if you've heard about GRUs or LSTMs that provide gating mechanisms for how you read and how you write into the hidden space. Um, but they have problems with training, um, and they're not super efficient for training, and they also have these vanishing gradient problems. Transformers, on the other hand, are more efficient to train because they allow you to parallelize all these operations. They also use positional encodings as you go along to enable that parallelization, but that doesn't get rid of the fact that it's still n squared. Um, and so transformers also give you the benefit of being able to look back at the entire sequence so you don't have to try to like collapse all of this stuff into one hidden space. So Mamba itself is what they call a state space model. At the end of the day, it is just a linear recurrent network but they have this added benefit within the paper that makes it really fast for training. And I think this was the biggest thing that I had to wrap my head around while I was reading the papers. I'd actually never heard the term SSM before. Um, so I was like, what the heck is SSM? What is S4? I found this nice resource called the annotated S4, as well as this YouTube video of I think he's one of the authors of the paper, of the S4 paper that goes through it. Um, and a few takeaways that I had were an SSM has a broad meaning and an RNN 
is an SSM. Uh, hidden Markov model, you might have heard of those. Kalman filters or Kalman filters are also SSMs. So these aren't like a new concept, um, and they even state that in the paper. Um, and at their core, they're actually a relatively simple model. Um, some of these papers, as you dive into them, it starts very simple, and then they just throw in these concepts that feel like you need a PhD in mathematics to understand them. So we're going to start with the simple part, and I might get a little hand wavy as we get to the PhD math stuff, but let's start with what we can understand. So you'll see all of these equations um, for a structured state space model. Uh, the main ones that I want to bring to your attention are these two right here. Um, but at the end of the day, a state space model takes in a one dimensional input sequence, maps that to an n dimensional latent space, and then projects it down to a 1D output sequence again. So very similar to the recurrent neural network that we talked about before. The input could be a word embedding, it could be, or like a list of word embeddings, it could be an audio waveform, it could be video, whatever it is, we're just projecting it to this latent space and then project, projecting it to an output sequence. And SSMs like the S4 can be defined through these two relatively simple equations. Um, they're just vector and matrix math and additions. <laughs> so there's this H prime, which is the derivative of the hid hidden space, is equal to this A matrix multiplied by the current hidden space and then added to this B matrix multiplied by X, which is the input. And then you have your output, which is multiplied by the C matrix, which is the hidden space multiplied by the C matrix. All of the parameters, all of the matrices, A, B, and C are learned by gradient descent, like we have um, in our traditional neural networks. And they define a lot of the a lot of the structure of these right below all of the equations. I thought it might be helpful to draw out what it actually looks like um, in kind of block diagrams here. So the derivative of the hidden space is going to be you take that input word embedding, you multiply it by this, it's actually a B vector. You can see it's B is N by one. And then you add that to the hidden space, which is N by D. D is the dimension of the word vector. N is the size of your model hidden space. And then A is just N by N. So it's a pretty straightforward, just like three matrix or two matrix multiplications added together to get the change in H over time. And then how you get the output Y of T, which is going to be like the next word in the, in the sequence, is you simply multiply your hidden space, which is N by D above, by your C vector parameters that you're going to learn. And that's how you get the next Y. So it's actually pretty straightforward. It's just a linear model internal to this SSM, um, which is pretty shocking to me that that was just like one of the key things was swapping out an LSTM cell or a GRU cell with this pretty simple linear system, but they do wrap it in nonlinearities outside, um, which we'll dive into in a bit. I like to think of these things similarly to an LSTM or a GRU, where like the A matrix tells us how the hidden space should be updated over time. So we're multiplying A by the hidden space. The B matrix tells us how much of the current input should be transformed into the hidden space. So we're multiplying the input by B. So this is really like one of the filters of 
how much we should update the hidden space by given the input. And then C converts the hidden space, the hidden state to the final output. So this is kind of like the output gate in an LSTM where we're taking information that's encoded in the hidden space and trying to project that into the output. Yes, Ben. Uh, there's a question in the chat about if the authors give a like any type of motivation for why that differential equation, you know, why that is the formula for the derivative essentially. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I know these state space models are inspired by a lot of models that they use in like electrical engineering and other engineering fields that they just know this formulation is good for sequential time series type problems or continuous problems that you're solving, but they don't dive too deep into that in this particular paper. I'm sure there's other papers like the S4 one that might have some more details there. That's a good question. So then, so that's just these, these equations right here. Um, they have a bunch of other ones as you go along here. The biggest takeaway from the other ones is this, in my opinion, is this discretization step. So what they say is this step takes all of the continuous parameters and allows you to turn them into discrete variables that we're going to feed into this model. Um, and the discretize, discretize, that's a hard word to say. The process of making them discrete <laughs> involves this step called delta. Um, and so you can think of that as like a step size of how much of the information we want to grab. And the model actually, from what I gathered, can learn different step sizes in different um, different layers of the model. So delta is also a learnable parameter. And you can, you can think of it of like, how do you chop A, B, and C into discrete parts um, and help the model learn things at different scales? Uh, it's still a little fuzzy to me how that all works. This is where I'm like, somebody way smarter than me put all these equations together and made it work. Um, but yes, Scott, for Alex. Uh, yeah, Alex, I don't know if you want to jump on and ask your question, or Greg, if you can uh, also look at the chat. There is, it says, gen tangential to the paper. Uh, is, is it possible to leverage the state space embedding to do things similar to how we use word embeddings now? And if yes, what would that use case be? I'm having trouble wrapping my head around that. Yes, totally. So what's really nice about these state space models is they give you that hidden state. Um, so this H of T. And um, if you look at like this diagram here, um, often people will use the hidden state of these recurrent neural networks as either like a vector that you can use for a search space. So like if you think of a vector database, often if you're encoding a bunch of sentences into a vector database and then trying to find similar sentences, the argument is that uh, this H of N um, will have all of the information <laughs> about that sentence. And then you can start doing like similarity searches within the hidden space instead of trying to just do like straight string matching. So that would be one one use case um, for the state space. Cool. And then the, the other thing that they mentioned about this um, making all of the parts discrete is and having different step sizes is what they call resolution invariance. So like I said, different SSM layers can look at different dependencies at different resolutions of the just going to say input instead of text. Um, so that's pretty cool. They also think of this discrete step as the kind of gating mechanism or, or normalization, but they don't go too deep into why that is. So now that we know SSMs and state space models, that's 
just the core building block, what they actually add in this paper, because what I've covered so far is basically what they did in the S4 paper. This paper builds on top of that with what they call selective state space models. So if you think of my example before, um, they say they're trying to solve the problem of what information to collapse into that hidden space. So they say selection can be thought of as a means of compression. Um, so I guess that's another use case, Alex, um, for the, the state space is just like, this is a compressed representation of the input space. And they note that attention actually doesn't do much compression at all. It gives the model full access to the full history because all of the words can talk to each other at any point in time. Um, and it's it's good to note that like attention solved this, solved this problem and can be used in combination with RNNs if you really wanted to get that benefit of looking back into the whole history. It's just really computationally expensive. So they're trying to go down a route that um, uses a selection mechanism instead of attention uh, to save all of that information. And so there's always this like efficiency versus effectiveness trade-off of how well models compress their state. If you have like really small state, like we showed above with like only four parameters, it's gonna be way more efficient, but you're not gonna be able to have as robust predictions. And then if you have a large state space, you can have lots of context, but the model will be slower while being more accurate. So, they test this ability to be able to remember information over long sequences with a couple synthetic copying tasks that we can go over later. They also do some looking at induction heads, which is, if you remember from our mechanistic interpretability dive, that was a cool feature of transformers that they found. And the core contributions of this paper are taking an SSM, adding a selection mechanism that allows the model to filter out irrelevant information and remember relevant information, they say indefinitely. I don't trust that, but <laughs> that's just my opinion so far. Um, and then they use a hardware aware algorithm that computes the model recurrently, um, but does it very efficiently in GPUs. They, they opt, they, use current GPU architectures to really make this recurrent step as fast as possible. So those are the main two contributions. And they say the combination of those two things give you high quality results on language modeling tasks, fast training and inference. And then they claim that it can scale up to these extremely long context lengths. Evan. So I feel like I've seen this promise of like linear time, like transformers, like for literally six years. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just wondering if like by definition, like it's just, you were saying that like transformers are just, they solve the problem and any attempt to make it faster is just going to be like asymptotically approaching what a transformer can already do. Mm -hmm. Is that that's the, the case? That's a good question. So the I think the reason that people were pretty excited about this paper um, is that it's the first one that takes, that compares to like transformer plus one plus, I guess was one of the best transformers at the time that they wrote this paper. And they said that Mamba is the first one that outperforms like comparable transformers on the same model size. Uh, and trained on the same amount of tokens and has this linear property. So they do have some evidence that this one, this does work a little better than the Transformers, but I think you're right that this promise has always been there and I'm still unclear as to why it actually works better. <laughs> I think my, my theory is like, even if it's like technically a worse algorithm than a Transformer, if you can scale it 10 times bigger, like you might be able to approximate what like a hundred times bigger transformer is with like a 10 times bigger algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, like if you compare the equal size, like it, 
I, I saw this theory that was like, it doesn't actually matter how good or bad your algorithm is. It just matters how big you can make it. Or how much data it can see in a certain time period. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I agree. I think that's one of the the biggest contributions here was they did this hardware aware state expansion they called where they could just crank through a lot more data faster. Um, yeah. And so it seems like yeah, it seems like maybe that is like really the the key finding. It maybe. <laughs> I I agree. I think that's one of the the, the biggest takeaways. Um, for sure. So I think with all that being said, um, the selection mechanism is interesting to look at. Um, and actually, even before we get to that, I wanted to mention there's this cool trick that they do in the SS4 paper to kind of go along with that intuition that we just talked about, where they're like, well, convolutional neural networks are really efficient to train. Can we reform or can we formulize an R RNN into a convolutional problem? Just unroll the RNN representation and do like a one dimensional convolution over it. Um, and so in the SS4 paper and some of those other ones that this was built off of, they do this trick where CNNs are fast for training, RNNs are fast for in inference. If they were able to share the parameters between those two models and use them both at the same time, you kind of get the best of both worlds in, in their sense. Um, so that's kind of what the S4 paper did. What this builds on top of that is the selection mechanism. So uh, what that looks like is they show the algorithm down here in the paper. And I think it's important to look at this at the same time. So they take those equations that we had at the very top. And instead of just doing um, the A, B, and C matrices, they also wrap B, C, and the delta in another linear layer. And they say that linear layer um, adds a selection mechanism, which again, doesn't feel that groundbreaking to me. Uh, it feels like kind of what you're doing in a GRU or LSTM, just apply it to these structured state space models. Um, but that's kind of how they go from the S4 to the S6 or the Mamba um, within the SSM model. But it's not just the SSM model that makes up all of Mamba, because I was also thinking, I was like, what, how this is just like a linear layer. It doesn't feel like it should be that much better. So what they do is they embed, and they're not the first people to do this. There's H3 um, that did, did this, but they embed the SSM, which is all that linear magic that we did before inside something that looks very similar to a transformer block where they have the input come in uh they pass it they first expand the input with a linear projection which is different than some of the other papers they then run a linear convolution over that extended expanded space they then have the ssm run on the output of that convolution and then feed it through as well as having the residual stream coming through the other side here. Um, so they kind of pass the information straight through here as well. And in between each one of these, there are nonlinearities um, and convolution. So that kind of answered my question of state space model um, isn't just like a linear model. It has kind of this Mamba block. Yeah, Evan. So I, uh, I might have missed this, but are you is an SSM different in rec to a recurrent network because it's just like a unrolled, uh, like recurrent operation? That's that can be um, done all at once. They're like, actually the same thing. It's just a uh, recurrent neural network is a version of an SSM. It's like oh, a okay. So it's yeah. like a subset. Okay. So this is like you could replace this with a GRU cell or an LSTM cell if you really wanted to. In mm -hmm. here, they just choose the SSM because it's efficient. Cool. So that's kind of what the full 
Mamba block looks like. Similar to a transformer block, you can stack all of these on top of each other. I looked in their repo and they have a bunch of different like depths of this model and sizes of the linear projection um, that they ran experiments with. And um, I will say this is the part that gets fuzzy for me, like why this architecture solves the compression problem for sequence lengths up to a million. Like I said, it feels like you could just swap out those things with the LSTM or GRU, but maybe it's simply that fact of we can crank through more data. I put in a Reddit thread <laughs> and asked this to people and I haven't gotten a uh, satisfying answer yet, but maybe somebody smarter than me will, will put something in there. Uh, evaluation wise, they do run this model on a few different tasks that are pretty interesting. The first one is just a bunch of synthetic data. And this is where they prove out the sequence length to a million, um, where they have like just a random set of numbers that they want to copy uh, from here to here. And they build an enormous sequence length there. And they look at if it does similar things to transformers um, like the induction heads. So if you remember from the other dives we did, induction heads are a task from the mechanical or mechanistic interpretability lens that have a surprisingly predictive nature to them. And it's pretty much like the fact that if you have a big, say you took like the first couple pages of Harry Potter and you ran it through, uh, every time you see the word potter it can kind of look back at previous examples within the context window and be like oh harry usually came before potter and after usually there's like a verb or a preposition or something like that um so that's what the induction heads do scott oh you're you're putting in the Reddit thread. Awesome. Yeah, some good conversation going there to, to answer some of the questions. Um, and the mechanistic interpretability papers did a really cool job of like visualizing this with an actual trained model, if you want to go check that out, where you can highlight a sub, um, a sub word like L-E-Y, um, and you can see that it looks back at the other parts of the context that had that L-E-Y. And if you notice, like, Mr. Dursley was, the Dursleys had, um, it's a similar pattern for both of those. So they posit that that's just like a really good way to model sequences is look back at the previous one and do some copying. Um, and Mamba just blows some of the other state space models out of the water on this task. Um, you can see that for the induction head task of seeing how well it can copy that information, all of these other models trail off kind of at like the thousand or 10,000 token length. And then Mamba just cruises all the way up to a million, um, which is kind of mind blowing. It just kind of stays at the top of this chart here. Um, and they have some more specific numbers on accuracy here. And you can see all these other models fade, 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 and then just can't do anything. And Mamba's like, yep, we got it <laughs> all the way through. Um, I would like to just acknowledge that just because it can remember up to a sequence length of a million doesn't mean that it's fast to do that. Like it's still a linear with respect to the batch size, the sequence length, the hidden size and the word vector dimension. So like, yes, it is faster than a, um, than a quadratic one, but it's still a lot of compute to do that. They also just do pure language modeling, uh, like predicting the next word. And they compare that to scaling laws of other transformers and RetNet and Hyena and some of these more linear models that you would have heard of recently. And they show that Mamba 
scales better than all of those on the predicting the next word task, which is pretty cool. And then they they not only do the what's the perplexity of predicting the next word, but they apply that to all of these data sets that are kind of being becoming standard in the LLM space, um, like Lambada and Helleswag and Pika. These are like question answering data sets or reasoning data sets. And if you look at models that are the same size as Mamba, it pretty much beats everyone that has been trained at that same size, at least in the open source world. Um, they have yet to do anything larger than a 2.8 billion parameter model or train on anything larger than the pile data set, which is like 300 billion tokens, but pretty promising results so far. It's not just text. They do this for DNA modeling and classification, which I thought was an interesting one that I hadn't heard of before. Um, so, whoa, that is not what we wanted. They look at the task of just taking a random sampling of a contigu contiguous segment of DNA and trying to predict what species it, it, it is. Um, and obviously DNA sequences are extremely long. It just really doesn't like this image, but <laughs> the idea is it scales pretty well for the human lemur, mouse and pig, but also this great ape species classification, which they claim is a little harder going between humans, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, et cetera. Um, and then they apply it to audio generation as well. So if you think of like an audio signal, that's a really long sequence. There's this data set of classical piano that they trained this model on. Um, I guess these images are just too small <laughs> for Notion. Uh, but they show that for both generating realistic piano and generating realistic speech commands, uh, Mamba outperforms many of the state-of-the-art larger models, such as GANs or diffusion models for the audio tasks. So not just text. I'm I feel like from kind of the one of the earlier archive dives that we did talking about um, like you know, applying these techniques to audio, it seemed like I come from kind of a classical music background too, and it always seemed like locally things made sense, uh, but would drift off into like different keys and uh, different styles entirely, you know, cross decades and a long term dependency. So I'd love to hear some of that uh, Mamba generated yeah. uh, classical piano music. They have some clips on their site. I, you know, Again, I think they trained on a very small <laughs> set of data, like four hours of solo piano music. But for training on just that, I was impressed. It sounded like piano. Yeah. You would totally. know much better than me. Evan, what's up? Um, one of the problems with generating noise is that um, if you're going to generate the raw amplitudes of the, the audio wave, it's like absurdly expensive. So I'm just wondering, like, is that what they did? Or what yeah. I see most of the time is that they'll uh, generate some token that gets decompressed by some sort of like uh, autoencoder network. So like, what, what do they do? Uh, as far as I could tell, they are predicting the raw waveform. Um, that's, and that's crazy. How long yeah. does that take? That's abs that's actually absurd. Like, <laughs> Well, that's part of the reason that I think they only did these like all of the speech, like all the speech experiments were just somebody saying the word zero or nine. So that's okay. literally just 16,000, you know, if it's yeah. just a second long. Uh, the audio, the piano ones, I think were a couple seconds. So that gets into the hundreds, maybe hundreds of thousands of length. But since they say this scales up to a million, it seems to work well, but I agree that is yeah. insane. <laughs> I'd love to see somebody do it on like a MIDI representation on piano, which I saw a tweet about, but I lost forever. Oh. So I wonder if anybody's working on that. For sure. I bet they are. Uh, is there a big data set for that? I'm sure there is, just with the sheer amount of like, you know, the entirety of the classical music, ca music canon basically being available for free on the internet, but just question if somebody's MIDI-ized it. I'm sure. I'm sure someone yeah. has. 
for sure. That'd be fun to find. We should put that into Oxen then. <laughs> <laughs> and make a MIDI player. That would be fun. <laughs> um, cool. So all in all, pretty encouraging experimental evidence um, that RNNs are still a promising um, direction of resource or, or of, of research. Uh, they did have a few notes on like some of the steps that they did worked well for text, but not for audio so they did some ablation studies at the end of the paper if you want to look at like what parts they removed to make it better at the audio waveforms um and like i said i feel like i understood the paper but i didn't understand why it worked really well on a lot of these things so i asked in reddit um if somebody can describe the difference and if you know anyone on this call has any ideas, feel free to put them in there. And there's been some discussion so far that has kind of been people saying, like, uh, it is just the fact that you can't really train a GRU on as much data as this technique. So it is the scaling factor. Um, but I would, I even tagged the author on Twitter, but he hasn't gotten back to me. <laughs> Maybe he has the answer. Hey, I was going to say, the, the scaling thing seems like kind of probable because like LSTM and grooves were made when like a sequence length of a thousand was a lot. So yeah. it might just be like literally just how you apply that architecture to long sequences. Totally. I would love now, especially with like A100s and stuff like that, like let's run the same experiment on an LSTM <laughs> and it will take longer, but you know they didn't have that in any of the comparisons here so i'd be really curious to see how it performed daniel yeah uh thanks i just had a yeah, I actually a note about this so um i was i'm recently working on a research project with some colleagues and um we had a relatively small data set to start with and we found that training a transformer was well was was longer um and it um didn't do as well and we switched to an LSTM because we had a relatively small data set with fairly short sequence lengths and it was substantially faster and it performed not like the, the performance wasn't like massively better but it was better for our use case um That's cool so you know um and, and I've heard this in the past that like you know if you're dealing with a smaller data set with shorter sequences you, you know LSTMs might be pretty good um so it sounds like there's yeah there's some interesting uh questions there for sure totally I think it's hard to equate exactly, like depending on how the not like the number of trainable parameters, like it might not be equivalent how useful each one is in each algorithm. So like even if you match the trainable parameters, it might still be wildly different. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, totally. It could, there could be something just in the inherent um, structure of like this S, like state model formulation of it with the yeah. A, B, and C matrix versus the you know LSTM what? formulation. You know what I think the word is for it? I think it's I think it's just inductive biases. So I think when we were dealing with really low compute, we needed to communicate these inductive biases to our algorithms. Yeah. Um, but now that the compute is becoming less limited, these are actually har more harmful than helpful as we scale up. So like it might just be that these are more general ways of representing problems. Totally. Um, they even showed that like in the vision transformer versus CNN paper where the CNNs worked better, better, better until we got to a certain amount of compute and then the <laughs> vision transformers took over. Which yeah. Makes, makes sense. That supports that. that. That's interesting. Yeah. We just need to make a dumber algorithm and it will work better. <laughs> a, a dumber algorithm that can see more data. And yeah. It'll just work better. <laughs> Love it. Well, I'm going to turn off the, the recording here just in case anybody else wants to chime in. but. Thanks everyone for joining for this. We'll, we'll post it on YouTube and we'll post it on our blog um, if you wanna share it or just rewatch it at any point.